Okay, we're going to talk about the thoracic and abdominal wall and answer the questions. What are the bones and muscles of the thorax and abdomen? What are the veins, arteries, and nerves of the thorax and abdomen? And what are the umbilical folds? Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Morton, and I'm the noted anatomist. So here are the things we're going to talk about. We're going to start with the thoracic skeleton. So the ribs are part of this thoracic skeleton, and there are 12 pairs of ribs, and they attach laterally to the 12th thoracic vertebrae. And they're broken down as follows. There's seven true ribs, three false, and two floating ribs. So here we have seven true ribs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And they attach directly to the sternum via costal cartilage. So there's one rib, and it attaches to the sternum via that costal cartilage. Now, the false ribs are eight, nine, and ten. And they attach indirectly to the sternum via... Uh, this more superior located costal cartilage. So there's a rib and you see this costal cartilage that's above. It's indirectly taking ribs 8, 9, and 10 and attaching it to the sternum. And finally, we have floating ribs, which are 11 and 12. And they're floating because there's no costal cartilage and they do not articulate with the sternum. That's why they call them floating ribs. Now, what is this costal cartilage? Well, this prefix or this word costal, whenever you see it, think rib. And uh, host, uh, costal cartilage is hyaline cartilage, and its purpose is connecting ribs to the sternum. But it also, its functionality contributes to the elasticity of the thorax, like in breathing when your chest wall expands and collapses, or in a case of like CPR when you're doing chest compressions that you can press on this chest wall and it gives a little. So here you notice that when you're compressing the thoracic wall and you're squeezing the heart and squeezing it, the chest wall pops back up. Most That is ribs, but most of that's the hyaline cartilage. Okay, so uh, the sternum or the breastbone is where the ribs and the costal cartilage attach. And the manubrium is the uppermost part of the bone. On the top of the manubrium, there's this little notch called the jugular notch or suprasternal notch in surface anatomy. It's right there. Then the sternal body is the main part of the sternum, and that's where uh, a good majority of the um, costal cartilage from the true ribs articulate uh, with the sternum. And then the sternal angle is this little angle that's between the manubrium and the sternal body. And it is a pretty shallow angle, but it can be felt or palpated with the fingers. So you see the manubrium and you see the sternal body and right there, the sternal angle, it's important to kind of know this because that's where the second rib attaches. If you know where the second rib is, you know where the second intercostal space is and now you can count intercostal spaces. Now, why do we care about that? Well, let's say that you're told that the pulmonic valve is auscultated in the second left intercostal space. So you do this and you stick I don't know if it makes that sound, but you stick the stethoscope there and that's where you best can hear uh, blood flowing through the pulmonic valve. Um, so you find the jugular notch, which is the manubrium, then you find the sternal body, and then you can palpate the sternal angle where rib two articulates, and below that is the second left intercostal space, and that's where you place the stethoscope. And the aortic valve, mitral, and uh, tricuspid valves all are found in the, to listen to using this process for the intercostal spaces. Now, the xiphoid process is this very pointy part at the very bottom of the sternum, and you want to be careful of that doing CPR. You don't break it off. Now, how do ribs course in the thorax and in the abdomen, actually? Well, there is the T2 vertebra, which means the second rib attaches to that, and as the ribs course anteriorly, they go at a downward angle, like a tall person hugging a short person. And so when we see the anterior attachment of the second rib, and then we go horizontally back, it is at the same level, the T4 vertebra. And so this is why this downward, uh, going from back to front, this downward angle, it looks different in axial imaging. So how does the downward direction of ribs look in axial imaging? So we take a lock that transverse thoracic plane, in this case through the uh, sternal angle, and here's an axial CT at the same level. And so that rib looks like that, that rib looks like that, and that rib looks like that, where you actually see three different ribs in one horizontal section because they curve downward. Now let's talk about muscles of the trunk wall. 
Well, let's do a little little detour. The trunk in anatomy consists of the neck, thorax, abdomen, and pelvis, and perineum. So here's a cross section of the abdomen. It's got one, two, three layers, and between the second and third layers were the vein artery and nerve course. Let's look at the thorax in cross section. There's one, two, and three layers, and the vein artery and nerve course between the second and third layer. That was fun. Let's do the neck as well. In cross section, there's one, two, three layers of these lateral wall, and the vein, well, actually, in this case, really just the artery and nerve course between that. So the take home point is this the anterior lateral trunk wall has three layers of muscles and the nerves and vessels course between layers two and three. And so when looking at the thoracic wall, we have these superficial muscles that support the uh, upper limb, like your pectoralis major, pectoralis minor, and the serratus anterior, and I'm gonna leave those muscles for upper limb dialogue. We're gonna focus on the dip, deeper intercostal muscles that support the thoracic cage. And so the intercostal muscles, they are three layers of muscles that segmentally are located between the ribs and costal cartilage. So here is a, uh, a section of the thoracic, thoracic uh, cage, and there are the two ribs with three layers of intercostal muscles. Here are two more pairs of ribs and three layers of intercostal muscles, and two more ribs with three layers of intercostal muscles. They're segmentally located between ribs and costal cartilage. So if we take this one window and blow it up, it looks like this, and there is one to three layers of intercostal muscles. And an anatomist said, well, what should we name this? Well, this intercostal muscle is the most external, so we'll call it the external intercostal. And this one's deep to it, so we'll call it the internal intercostal. Well, what do we call this one? The innermost intercostal muscle. And there are the three layers of intercostal muscles that we have. <coughs> now, the attachments are basically along the inferior and superior border of adjacent ribs, is where all these three intercostal muscles attach. Now, their actions. Well, the external intercostal muscle, it courses, uh, it's primarily found in the posterior and lateral portion. It is going to elevate the rib cage. When it does so, it expands the lungs in an anterior and lateral direction. And so, elevating the ribs increases lung volume and assists in inspiration or inhalation. Now, the inter in internal internal intercostal muscle depresses the ribs, which decreases lung volume and assists in expiration or when you exhale. To be honest, I don't know how much of a muscle that it does that. Most books say it, but I don't think it's a whole lot. And finally, there's the innermost intercostal muscle that does very little of anything for breathing, but it's the part that's closest to the costal parietal pleura, that serous membrane that lines the internal surface of the rib cage, so that inter innermost intercostal muscle stiffens in contraction, so it stiffens intercostal space to prevent retractions uh, of the intercostal spaces during inspiration, or that sucking in. It basically keeps a firm wall between ribs. Now let's talk about anterior abdominal wall muscles. Well, there are three muscle layers as well as we talked about before. An anatomist said, well, this is the most external one in the abdomen and it, the fibers course at an angle, so we'll call it the external oblique muscle or external abdominal oblique. Well, if there's an external oblique, there's gotta be an internal oblique because those muscle fibers are at an angle and it's a cross or 90 degree angle, the external. And this third one, has muscle fibers that go in a transverse plane, so they called it the transverse abdominus muscle. There's those three layers of muscles. So the external oblique muscle located right there, um, it has an attachment from the anterior superior iliac spine all the way down to the pubic bone, and we call that the inguinal ligament. Um, and the external oblique is there, and as the muscle courses forward, the muscle becomes this big aponeurosis, a band of fascia of dense, regular CT. We call it the external oblique aponeurosis that forms part of the anterior layer of the rectus sheath and it fuses between the two rectus abdominis muscles as the linea alba. Now the internal oblique muscle is located there and in cross section there it is with its internal oblique aponeurosis which then bifurcates and forms part of the anterior and posterior layers of the rectus sheath to again fuse in the midline as the linea alba. And finally, the transverse abdominus muscle there is the third layer. Its transverse abdominus aponeurosis forms part of the posterior layer of the rectus sheath, and it helps fuse in the midline to make the linea alba.
Now the rectus abdominis, rectus means straight and abdominis on the abdomen, is this muscle there in that cutout, or on the other side, I just drew the uh, rectus sheath covering the whole part of the rectus abdominis as of course is from the pubic bone all the way up to the sternum and costal cartilage. In cross section, there's the rectus abdominis muscle. Now the rectus abdominis is surrounded by the rectus sheath. Now the rectus sheath is shown there as it's shown here and, and there as well, but there is showing the rectus sheath that's been cut open. And if the rectus abdominis is the muscle, the rectus sheath is where you put the sword in the sheath. And the rectus abdominis is a sword. Does that make sense? Uh, something that I just thought is a little tangent is there's the rectus abdominis. Now, in about 7% of the population, there's this muscle called the sternalis muscle or the rectus sternalis muscle, which is a homologous muscle to the rectus abdominis, except it's in the thorax. Uh, I, I don't know all the evolutionary biology and comparative anatomy why we don't really have one anymore, but about 7% of the population, you'll see it. I've only, in my 20 years dissecting, I've seen it twice. Now, these uh, abdominal body wall muscles have the following movements. They do this, as in doing a crunch. We call that flexion of the vertebral column. We have this movement here, which we call rotation of the vertebral column, and then this motion here, which we call lateral flexion of the vertebral column. So there's those three movement muscles associated with the obliques and the rectus abdominis, your core abdominal muscles. Plus, when they contract together, they increase intra-abdominal pressure. So this is like if you're ex giving a forced exhalation. So put your hand on your tummy and breathe out really hard, you'll notice those muscles contract. If you cough <coughs> or vomit, well, don't vomit, or urinate or defecate or give birth to a child, all of those require an increase of intra-abdominal pressure, reducing the volume inside, which increases pressure. That's why you exhale by pushing the diaphragm up. That is accomplished by contracting these abdominal muscles. Uh, so now let's just kind of like do an overview of some of the layers of the abdominal wall. So we look at this and there's the skin, which is the epidermis and the dermis. And deep to that is the superficial fascia or your hypodermis. And in the abdomen, there's the it's two layers, a camper's fascia, which is fatty, and a scarpa's fascia, which is membranous. That has some clinical significance because below the umbilicus, that scarpa's fascia is most prominent and it needs to be sutured independently as you'd suture layer by layer if you do something like a fan and seal incision those layers of scarpus fascia must be uh, sewn together that was a bit of a tangent i'm the tangent master the anterolateral abdominal wall muscles like the external and internal obliques and the transverse abdominis and deep to that or and also rectus abdominis you just don't see it in this section and then the transversalis fascia this connective tissue that um, is deep to the transverse abdominis. Then there's extra peritoneal fat that binds the parietal peritoneum, the serous membrane, to the abdominal body wall. So there are all those layers of the abdominal body wall. Um, and now let's do one more thing. Let's do a coronal section and look at a posterior view of the anterior abdominal wall like this. There's something called the arcuate line. It's a horizontal line below the umbilicus. There's the umbilicus and there's this Kind of, well, it's a kind of a horizontal line. And it's important because the aponeurosis of the external and internal oblique, transverse abdominis, course anterior to the rectus abdominis at that arcuate line. In other words, below the arcuate line, there's no posterior wall of the rectus sheath. Let's do that again, except in cross section. So here's a cross section above the arcuate line. There's the external and internal oblique and the transverse abdominis, and the aponeuroses go around the rectus abdominis to form an anterior and posterior layer of the rectus sheath. And then you see on the back of the uh, rectus sheath, uh, there is the transversalis fascia. And then they all form that linea alba in the middle. Now. Let's take a cross section below the arcuate line where there's the external and internal oblique and the transverse abdominis, but look at all their aponeuroses. They go in front of the rectus abdominis to form an anterior layer of the rectus sheath, but there is no posterior layer. Okay, that means linea alba. So below the arcuate line, there is no posterior wall of the rectus sheath, so the transversalis fascia 
is the posterior part of the rectus abdominis below the arcuate line. This is important in, when you're doing sewing up incisions for different abdominal incisions to know what layers you're sewing up. Now let's talk about intercostal van. Now, the term intercostal means between the ribs. Remember that word costal means ribs, inter means between them. And van is an abbreviation for vein, artery, and nerve. And so there are two ribs, and there's an intercostal vein, artery, and nerve, and they usually course from top to bottom in that um, fashion. And notice at the bottom of the intercostal space, there is something called the collateral intercostal vans. Even in my illustration, I exaggerated it. They're not near that big. All right. Now, the intercostal vans are located between the second and third layer of muscles of the trunk wall, as we said before. So in the thorax, that's the internal and innermost intercostals, and in the abdomen, it's the internal oblique and transverse abdominus muscles. So here in the thorax, there's the intercostal van, and it's between the internal and innermost intercostal muscles. Now in the abdomen, there's the intercostal vein artery and nerve, and that's between the internal oblique and transverse abdominus muscles. All right, so the intercostal veins course along the inferior border of each rib. And another way of saying that is they course along the top of the intercostal space. So there are the two ribs, there's the intercostal van, and notice they're coursing along the bottom of the rib. Or, so bottom of the rib, or you could say, hey, there's the intercostal space, the van is at the top of the intercostal space. This is important so when you're doing, um, and you're putting, uh, for example, thoracensesis between the ribs, that you avoid hitting these three structures. Now, the intercostal vans supply the anterior lateral thoracic and abdominal wall. That's the main thing I wanted to say. In fact, I don't think I have a picture to show it. I don't. Okay, now let's talk about intercostal veins. Intercostal veins have the following tributaries that we're going to talk about, all right? So our focus is on the intercostal veins, but the other ones are showing where this blood is flowing. So here's an anterior lateral view of the thoracic wall, and there is one, two, three anterior intercostal veins, and they then drain their blood into this vein called the internal thoracic vein that courses vertically on the deep surface of the rib cage parallel to the sternum. And the internal thoracic veins drain into the brachiocephalic vein, which drains into the superior vena cava. Um, now the posterior intercostal veins, there, 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 and there, these ones are all going to drain into, on the right side, the azagous vein. And the azagous vein courses up and dumps into the superior vena cava. So the azagous vein drains the intercostal spaces on the right. But on the left side of the thorax, we have the um, accessory and hemi, uh, uh, the accessory hemiazagous and the hemiazagous veins that drain the left uh, intercostal spaces, and they drain into the azagous system of the azagous vein. All right, now let's talk about intercostal arteries, and here are the different uh, arteries that we need to discuss in talking about it. So, there in this anterior lateral view is the internal thoracic artery that branches off the subclavian artery, and it courses parallel uh, or adjacent to the internal thoracic vein, internal to the rib cage paralleling the sternum, and it gives rise segmentally to these anterior intercostal arteries that supply each intercostal space. Now, the thoracic aorta courses down, and it gives rise segmentally at each intercostal space, a posterior intercostal artery. And yes, and then they form an anastomotic connection. Now, an anastomosis between the anterior and posterior intercostal arteries looks something like this. There's the anterior and posterior intercostal arteries, and the blood then flows, and where they meet in the lateral uh, body wall, that connection between these two vessels is called an anastomosis and allows for collateral circulation. Now, the intercostal nerves course in the intercostal space, provide motor innervation to intercostal and abdominal wall muscles, and sensory to thoracic and abdominal wall for the skin and the deeper serous membranes. So here we have an intercostal nerve coursing between um, the second and third layer of muscles. And notice each layer, that yellow circle, represents an intercostal nerve at every segmental level. 
Now, motor innervation. So if we take a cross-section to the thorax and see this, notice that the intercostal nerve innervates the external, internal, and innermost intercostal muscles. Or in the abdomen and cross-section, oh no, in the, this is just an anterior view, we can see the external, internal, oblique, and transverse abdominis. And there's our rectus abdominis. And notice that at each segmental level, you've got these intercostal nerves and they're going to supply innervation to the external oblique, internal oblique, and transverse abdominis and rectus abdominis muscles. Sensory supplying the skin of the thoracic abdominal wall and the serous membrane. So there's an intercostal nerve and it provides sensation of the skin laterally and anteriorly. And in the abdomen, there's the intercostal nerve, again, between the second and third layer, providing sensation from the skin of the lateral and anterior abdominal wall. And this is done segmentally, so it's in a dermal tomal pattern. And so intercostal nerves be a form, they're the nerves for the dermatomes of the thorax and the abdomen. So there we've got, so with the T3 intercostal nerve, there's the T3 dermatome, and T4 intercostal nerve, T4 dermatome, and all the way down for every segmental level, including the L1. Now, sensation also uh, contributes to innervation of the serous membrane. So in the thorax, there's the intercostal nerve and there's the parietal pleura. It's now, you see those tiny arrows. It's providing somatic sensation to the parietal pleura. That's why if you get pleurisy or pneumonia, it can result in sharp, specific somatic pain. And in the abdomen, there's the intercostal nerve between the second and third layer, and there's the parietal peritoneum, that serous membrane. Again, we see, whoops, oh, I hate it when I do that. Now I've got to go all the way back through, and oh, look at this. Mm-hmm. La, la. There. Okay, so in, this, in the abdomen, this is why if you get inflammation of the peritoneum, the parietal peritoneum, it results in a sharp, somatic, specific pain. And also, why peritonitis is so painful all around the abdomen. And let's final uh, conclude with the umbilical fold. So we'll do this coronal section again and look at an internal view of the anterior abdominal wall. There are five folds of parietal peritoneum that cover structures on the deep surface of the anterior abdominal wall. One median and two medial umbilical folds and two lateral umbilical folds. Let's start with the one... Oh, and in this picture that we're going to use, you see that dotted yellow line? On this side is with the parietal peritoneum that's covering each structure. On the other side, we stripped away the parietal peritoneum so you can see the structures. Um, the median umbilical fold is unpaired. It is the remnant of the embryonic urachus. And now in an adult, it's just connective tissue. So there's the median umbilical fold. There's the urinary bladder. And this connective tissue courses from the bladder all the way up to the umbilicus right there. That's where urine used to drain out. And um, this is why in some congenital defects, uh, infants can have uh, urine drip out of their belly button because that urachus is, no, is, is not turned into connective tissue. It's still patent. Now, there are two medial umbilical folds. This is the remnant of the umbilical arteries, and in an adult, it's connective tissue. So there's the medial umbilical fold, and because it's covered in peritoneum, but if it's not, that umbilical artery is what it's called. And so the way I kind of think of the difference is, think of someone standing behind a, you know, some drapes. You just see drapes covering a body, and you move the drapes, and you see a person sitting beside. That sounded kind of creepy. wasn't meant to. I'm hoping that was an image that helped you understand umbilical folds from the structures deep to it. So the internal iliac artery gives rise to the umbil the internal iliac artery gives rise to the umbilical arteries that course up to the umbilicus and that's what formed your um, uh, basically your umbilical cord umbilicus. So here's a, a little kiddo a fetus, there are those two umbilical arteries right there coursing into the umbilical cord. And when this baby is born, they involute and they're now called the obliterated umbilical arteries. And when we have them hidden behind the parietal peritoneum, we call it the medial umbilical folds. Now the two lateral umbilical folds are what house the inferior epigastric vessels. So there's a lateral umbilical fold and, uh, 
when we strip away the parietal peritoneum, that lateral umbilical fold is hiding the inferior epigastric artery, which arises from the external iliac artery and then courses all the way up on the internal surface of the abdominal wall, and it forms an anastomotic connection with the superior epigastric artery. Let's do that again. There's our subclavian, and remember that internal thoracic artery that descends? Well, that internal thoracic artery gives rise to two branches, one of which is the superior epigastric artery that forms an anastomotic connection with the inferior epigastric artery. Shing! Anastomosis. So there's the anastomosis on the other side, deep to the rectus abdominis, which is between the superior epigastric and the inferior epigastric arteries. And that, my friends, is the thoracic and abdominal wall in a nutshell. <clears throat>